cambiar vidas, change organizations, change organizations, change the world. Huggy and I are excited to talk with you and to see uh, many of your smiling faces, including Susan, who's on a walk, which is kind of cool. And um, and so uh, we're going to talk about our new book, The Friction Project. Um, one thing sort of philosophically is that we have a bunch of slides and uh, we'll get through maybe all of them, maybe part of them. I think the most important thing is we have a good conversation. So jump in with chat and questions. And, uh, and and the key thing we want to do, just to give us all a preview of coming attractions, is at the bottom of the hour, we, we want to do something called the subtraction game. So that's sort of the coming, the preview of coming attractions. Uh, Huggy, you want you want to add anything before we start getting into the meat? Yeah, that's an excellent preview, Bob. Let's get into the meat. All right. So, uh, so this book, which just came out um, a couple of months ago, The Friction Project, um, one thing that I think is is um, important to put in context is, to me at least, and Huggy and I don't agree on everything, so you might not agree with this. Um, I, I see this book as part of a stream of research on leading at scale, and this is a this is a set of problems that Huggy and I have been working on. I, Huggy, when I calculate, it gets close to twenty years. Isn't that uh, amazing, Bob? I think 2004, 2005, yeah. we started talking about this stuff. So to us, that's three kinds of things. Uh, we expect our, our last book in 2014 focused more on growing organizations, what Silicon Valley uh, venture capitals and stuff call you know, scaling, spread, so spreading good things throughout organizations. And then what happened is that there are all these organizations that we know Facebook, Salesforce, Google, that uh, that we actually had quite a bit of involvement in early. And then they got really big and things were really hard to do. So we got interested in friction. <laughs> so we so uh, we started out this adventure with the bad news. I'll do this one, Huggy, and you jump in. Here's some bad news. Uh, just an example, this is from Harvard Business Review. Um, there was a weekly executive committee meeting in a large corporation. That's where all the execs get together. And Bain calculated that all the pre-meetings, all the pre-work and everything, it required 300,000 hours of effort by people throughout the organization. That sounds like friction to me. Um, another example, which we'll talk about more, there used to be a form at the state of Michigan for people who needed benefits, money, things like that, uh, health care. It had 40, it was 42 pages long. It had a thousand questions, 18,000 words, the longest one in the United States. Uh, 2.5 million residents completed. They still do some variation. And to give you an example of a bad question, one was, when was your child conceived? Um, which I don't know the answer to. I have three children. Um, and uh, and just here's an example of also some overload. This is actually my daughter. This is a service rep at a, at a company that's actually color. Uh, she had 15 apps and 20 open screens once on her 13-inch laptop. She showed me. So these are so so. Huggy, why don't you talk about the next one since it's yours? So <laughs> the net result you can imagine is uh, as Bob and I were sharing ideas from scaling up excellence, uh, top and senior echelons of leadership in a company they really loved the message. As we went lower down to the middle and junior runs. People liked the message and the ideas in the book, but it was invariably accompanied by a lament. And the lament was, I don't have time to do things, or it's very hard to do things. Here's a representative quote from an executive who came to one of Stanford GS-based programs. And he looked at us and he said, I'm swimming in a sea of shit. I'm trying to stay afloat. They want me to show initiative, but it's impossible. So, and that kind of showcases the problem of time poverty and all the obstacles that make it hard for people to show initiative. And, and, and I love these kind of examples. And these are the reasons that we got interested in doing what we called the friction project. I, and we did a whole bunch of, uh, you know, being academics and having too much job security. Uh, <laughs> we did case studies. We did academic research. I had a podcast a couple of years. And, and also, we just talked to a lot of smart people, including a lot of GSB alums, about how they dealt with these problems. And to give you the headline, 
we started out with this pessimism that, oh, it's so hard to get everything done. And in fact, we were telling stories about this just before we went on, on air, of course. But two elements that came through. One is there's actually a lot of good news in the book about things that companies, leaders do to reduce bad friction. And the other part, and we'll dig into this more, is we really did learn that a lot of things in life should be difficult or impossible. So that's sort of the headline of the book. Huggy, would you add anything to the headline? I think uh, the only thing I would just uh, extend Bob's remarks is the, our principal realization was if you take out obstacles that infuriate people and overwhelm them, they find it easier to be curious and generous hmm. and take initiative. Yeah. And as Bob was just implying, but on the other hand, if you don't put in obstacles that slow people down and educate them, people are likely to be both overconfident and myopic at the same time. Yes. And so that's the problem that we were trying to, we quickly got a glimpse of. And what we're going to share with uh, is our ideas, reflections on what leaders do to make the right things easier they, and the wrong things harder. And, and uh, to give you uh, sort of two quick previews, this is this is getting rid of bad friction. Mm. Uh, this, this is an article from the, the New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Melinda Ashton. And all of us, at least in the States, and I just did something from executives from Columbia yesterday, they had the same issue. We know when we go to the doctor or the nurse practitioner or whatever, they will spend more time staring at the screen, typing in the electronic health records than actually talking to us. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to support this. And uh, Dr. Melinda Ashton, uh, what she did was with her team is she said, uh, could you please, uh, people in Hawaii Pacific, send us things that are poorly designed, getting in the way, just plain stupid. She got 188 su suggestions. They implemented 87 improvements. And you can see just as an example, by just eliminating one click in this large system uh, for uh, nurses and, nurse and so forth that were doing uh, rounds, it saves 1,700 nursing hours uh, per month. So that's just an example of simple subtraction and getting rid of bad friction. Um, an example of using good friction is this is Noam Barden, who's actually been a guest in your class multiple times, hasn't he, Huggy? Yes. Very. And uh, in the early days of Waze, after they got Series B financing, um, the venture capitalists wanted them to hire a bunch of people and do a bunch of product development. The problem was that when people downloaded the early versions of Waze, 30 days later, none of them would be using it. So we literally stopped the company, hit the brakes and said, we're going to spend six weeks. We're not going to hire every, anyone and we're going to figure out what's wrong. So they hit the, hit the brakes. They figured out what was wrong. And then they started doing product development and hiring people. And many of you may know that uh, Gnome sold the company to Google for about a billion dollars. So that's the gas in the brakes. And that's sort of our uh, big analogy. Um, what we're going to do during the course of our hour together, and pretty soon we're going to get to the subtraction game, is we're going to talk about three main, uh, they're basically chapters in the book. The book has five on-ramps that we say that you as leaders and, uh, and just anybody who's an individual contributor to can jump in and make things better. And these are three of the five chapters that uh, that we're going to talk about that are in the book. Uh, Huggy, before I get to addition sickness, do you want to add something? The only thing I just want to quickly highlight to people is, uh, you know, the lovely example by Melinda Ashton shows us what's possible. We, of course, have... Uh, you know, accomplished physicians here in this group. Uh, Ganga Nadella is here, and she is the chief medical officer, if I recall, at One Medical. Oh. And yeah, so uh, <coughs> the only thing that I just wanted to highlight is what, com what we find when companies take out bad friction, the trap they kind of run into is it's the one and done trap. I've got to fix one thing, and that's the end of it. And, you know, what uh, Drew Houston of Dropbox taught us was subtraction is like mowing the lawn. You got to do that pretty regularly. Yes. You don't do that once and then forget about it. Because if you don't mow the lawn, weeds are going to outstrip pretty much everything else. Yeah. That and I one little takeaway for all of you, if you're all wondering, how am I going to mow the lawn when I go back to work or whatever? 
you know, Bob and I were chatting about a chief operations officer who came to a Stanford uh, program. Uh, thank you for the correction, Ganga. I'm glad I promoted you. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody deserves it, it's you, uh, you know. Uh, so, but, you know, one of the chief operations officers, uh, when we asked him, is anybody mowing the lawn in your company? Nobody was, except this one person. And this young woman, very sharp person, said, we mow the lawn every week. And I said, how do you do that? And she said, well, I'm the COO. We have an executive leadership team. And guess what? One of the things we do in the meeting is we focus on something called the ridiculist, L-I-S-T and ridicule at the beginning. And the idea of the ridiculist is to pay attention to the crazy, nutty, stupid things that companies do and get them out of the way. So for all of you, when you get back to work, Think of what you need to have on your ridiculous for your company. Oh boy, I got a long one for Stanford. Um, all right, so um, so so let's talk a little bit more about about uh, the the problem of addition and subtraction, which Huggy has previewed with the ridiculous. So I'm glad you can spell it. So uh, so so we we talk about these as sort of traps. The first trap is what we call addition sickness. So one of the reasons subtraction is difficult. Is that, is that there's a whole bunch of forces that lead us as human beings to add rather than subtract complexity, all of us. So one is, and this is one of our buddies, it's his book, Lydie Klotz here, he's got his book right here, well, it's upside down, it's got a coffee stain on it. Uh, he and a bunch of his colleagues have, have documented with some 20 studies that the default uh, human problem solving solution when we face a problem, whether it's fixing a university, fixing a Lego creation, planning a trip, a trip is our default response is addition. And there's something evolutionary about that, like the people who gathered and saved all this stuff rather than throwing it away. Those, I guess, are the people who survived. But uh, so, so that's one cause is we're wired that way. The second cause is that in many organizations, there are perverse incentives to reward people who add rather than subtract. Yes, we know the book's Essentials, and that's a great book. Um, and and there are, uh, uh, one of the differences is that I, to be a snobby academic, is that that's a good book. But Lydie Klotz and his team, they did a whole bunch of peer reviewed studies. So, so, but it's the same message. So, anyways, so what happens in many organizations is the people add stuff. Rules, rituals, routines, they get promoted. And then to give you, um, uh, you know, one of my favorite or least favorite examples, a classic perverse incentives, which Stanford University has, and so does Google, by the way. So to give you two organizations is the more people who report to you in many organizations, the more pay and prestige you get. So there's a whole bunch of rewards for people who, bring, who build fiefdoms. And so this is a, a classic perverse incentive. And, uh, and, and so these are some of the things that organizations do that are beyond indi the individual tendency. And the last thing, and, and we've got the great organizational theorist here, George Carlin, describing this phenomenon, my shit is stuff, your stuff is shit. So all of us in theory may think that other people should subtract, subtract uh, uh, things to get in the way, but we've got our precious little thing. For us, it's actually doing stuff on friction that we think every organization should be thinking about. And, and that I, the problem of identity is one of the things that also makes subtraction hard. We've all we've got our precious thing that everybody should do. Perhaps we think one, one thing I'm quite interested in is app overload. We think that everybody should reduce the number of apps except for the precious app that we think is our favorite one. Uh, yes, yes, of course, the precious wisdom of George Carlin is in the book. Uh, you think we think we wouldn't do that? I wrote a book called The No Asshole Rule, so this is my mild, mild language for me. Um, okay, so how do you reverse it? If you look at Lydie Klotz's research uh, uh, with 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 a whole bunch of other folks, is once you prompt people to start thinking about subtraction, they're more likely to do it. Here's Michael Deering. Uh, and that's really how he looks, although uh, he is an early stage venture capitalist, actually an HBS grad. Uh, he has uh, funded more than 200 startups. Amazing guys. Harry Ra Harry's Razors, Masterclass, 
when Elon Musk um, bought Twitter, I asked him if he had any opinion. He, sa he said, yes, I've sold eight companies to Twitter, so I have a strong opinion that it's a screwed up company. So he has this argument that the best leaders act as editors in chief. And I kind of like that phenomenon because I think that's kind of the right an analogy. So that's, so how do you act as editor in chief? Uh, Huggy already talked about the ridiculous. Am I pronouncing it right, Huggy? Absolutely, Bob. And let, let me go through a few examples. And uh, in about seven minutes, we're going to have you play the subtraction game. So start thinking about stuff you want to get rid of in your, in your organizations. The first thing, one thing that we like are simple subtraction rules. So this, uh, my colleague Kathy Eisenhardt and Don Saul wrote a book on simple rules, shortcuts, crisp constraints that make addition um, uh, harder and subtraction easier. And just to give you an example from Google, this is uh, Laszlo Bach. Laszlo has been a, a guest in your class multiple times as well, hasn't he, Huggy? Yes, indeed, Bob. He was head of people operations, essentially head of HR at Google for about eight years. When he got to Google, there was a tradition which goes way back. In fact, I've got an interview that Jeff Pfeffer, who many of you know, many of you had classes from, we did an interview with Larry Page in 2002 where Larry Page said that we are doing as many as 20 interviews before we give job offers and everybody is mad at us, but we want people who are great at technology and will be great leaders like Marissa Mayer. Um, and so we interview the hell out of them. So this became a Google tradition. You can see all these interviews. The 25 comes from Laszlo. Laszlo gets there. Google is no longer the coolest place on earth to work. And there's a problem scheduling all these interviews. They're losing good candidates. He comes up with the simple rules. If you do more than four interviews, you need permission from me. And he said that dropped very quickly, almost immediately. So that's an easy one. Um, another example, and we're here, it is a subtraction game. And we're going to do this it almost immediately. So start uh, getting ready to put stuff in chat. We played this with more than 100 um, organizations. I did it yesterday with a senior team uh, from a Colombian concrete company. I've done it with 400 Salesforce folks. Huggy's done it with all sorts of organizations. And essentially, we ask people to, to identify subtraction uh, projects. So one example, an EVP from Microsoft. When I did this, he got rid of a stalled project. The weirdest experience I ever had was a CEO stood up. He had his 80, it was an insurance company, he had his top team of 80 people, and he offered them a $5,000 subtraction bonus if they got rid of two things. And the problem was I thought my speech was over, but it became my job to track them on a spreadsheet as they did subtraction. Uh, so that was sort of crazy. So that was addition for me and subtraction for them. Um, okay, Huggy, why don't you take this part over since I've been ranting for a while? Yeah, um, very quickly, there's a question by Deepak uh, uh, on chat uh, about, oh. uh, you know, how we train AI co-pilots. So, Deepak, of course, uh, the use of AI to fix friction, I think, is a, a compelling idea. Uh, Bob and I certainly have had conversations about this. The thing that we sort of feel is when you think of AI, if you only focus on the efficiency enhancing improvements that AI can generate and forget the people, bad things can happen. As one of the people whom we interviewed, Todd Park, in preparation for this book said, the most important thing in organizations is it's not just logistics or love. Love has to multiply logistics. And it's the same thing that would apply to the friction fixing idea that you have. If I can offer you a quick sort of an example, one case we've been thinking about writing is about a company that we can't mention. They have a complex networking operation. And as all of you know, network outages are super critical. And anytime you have a big networking operation, you have lots of log files. In this company, they had a billion two log files. It's humanly impossible to comb through them. Even if you employed people, it would be monotonous. So what did they do? They used large language models to comb through these log files, make improvements. And when I chatted with the head of the initiative and I said, how did it benefit network engineers? He said something compelling. And he looked at me and he said, the best thing Professor Rao is, what it does is my network engineers sleep better. 
they don't get woken up at 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. because the network has broken down. This is an example for us where AI can actually remove the friction of combing through monotonous work and enable you to take preventive action and most of all reduce sleep debt in organizations. Yeah, yeah. So before, so Huggy, why don't you start the subtraction game in a minute? Later on in the deck, if we get there, we may not get through the deck. There's actually a 2024 uh, uh, article in a uh, in a good journal that that uh, that ChatGPT was used to shorten and make more simple a surgical consent form that's filled out by 35,000 people in the state of Rhode Island. So so it can be used for subtraction too. So Huggy, why don't you so, get them going? So get, the get subtraction going? game, as the slide indicates, is uh, very straightforward. Think about your organization and think about what is driving you and your team crazy. Uh, you know, it's like a simple place to uh, start. And what is driving you crazy may be something that was once useful, but now is kind of in the way. So think about that and pick a couple of subtraction targets. And, uh, you know, um, you can add, pick more than one, two or three and please put it in the chat option. Have a little bit of fun, a couple of crazy, fun, mischievous subtraction targets in your company. Meetings, kill Slack, yeah. So so I, I like the Slack channels. I, I did something with Salesforce, which by the way, owns Slack. Uh, it was about 350 uh, vice presidents, and they complained about too many Slack messages. And, uh, and, and and one of them said, you know, it's us who's sending the messages. We have to control ourselves. <laughs> what strikes you, Huggy? Yeah. So I'm kind of looking at all of this. Meetings are, of course, a big part of, uh, uh, you know, what people are talking about. Um, no Zoom calls. Um. Oh yeah. So so our meetings. Uh, this isn't in the deck, but uh, we worked with uh, Rebecca Hines, who's got a PhD from Stanford in my department, and is now head of the Work Innovation Lab at Asana. And and this is an HBR somewhere. And uh, and we worked with them to have uh, sixty people in marketing evaluate all their standing meetings in terms of how difficult and how important they were. And then Rebecca guided them as they eliminated some, made some less often, uh, made some smaller. And the average person saved about four hours a month. So somebody was asking about quantifying friction fighting. That's an example. Every meeting should have an agenda. An agenda. What else do you think? What else strikes you, Huggy? I mean, what um, you know? Uh, some time ago, uh, uh, a research article that Bob and I found to be helpful is. We often think it's the number of meetings that is the problem. And of course, the number of meetings is a problem. But what actually saps energy is our back-to-back -back meetings. Yes. When you put people in two back-to-back -back meetings, that's it. They're kind of exhausted pretty much for the day. And yes, Roy, we love your idea of making standing meetings standing. Yeah, people better stand in standing meetings. And yes, killing lunch meetings is uh, certainly uh, uh, an interesting idea. Now, the other thing is, Rebecca, uh, whom Bob was just mentioning, um, both Bob and Rebecca in their experiments in Asana, one of the things they found is, the most frustrating meetings are the meetings that actually consume time but require a lot of effort on your part for no purpose whatsoever. And I think uh, those are the meetings you might want to go after. And yes, Shobana, update and read out meetings make a lot of sense too uh, because you get kind of like inundated by updates, uh, you know, beyond the point. I'm curious. What about a more extreme solution? How about implementing a scheme in your companies where everybody is given a meeting budget? It's well, only two, three idea. hours a week, and you decide which meetings you want to attend. And after your two, three hour budget is over, you can't attend any more meetings. Would people like that? Or would fear of missing out get in the way here? I, I I like Julie's point that remember there were phones before Zoom. What, yes. One thing that one thing that I've noticed is when I do media interviews, 
the really uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, um, and so forth, they will never do Zoom. They always do phones. And I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, so we've got a lot here, and we will be touching on these. So ju just a comment. Maybe you have a, a comment on a specific um, point, but but uh, please keep these coming as we go through. I really I, I think that it adds to the richness of the conversation. Um, so and just one more thing on app overload. I, I uh, so speaking of Rebecca Hines, she and I and uh, and another Stanford alum, uh, Paul Leonardi, did a uh, kind of an experiment with actually was with Asana and Amazon to reduce the number of apps, and we were not particularly uh, successful. And the reason was that uh, each person didn't have the power to get rid of apps; somebody else was imposing it on them. And uh, the most successful example I've I've seen um, was a CTO in an organization. So this is a top-down solution like Laszlo, who uh, whenever people bought a new app or renewed an app, they'd have to send them a memo why they were doing it. And they found, for example, they were paying for four versions of Slack, and they went from about 55 to about 20 apps in this sort of medium-sized company. All right, let's let's move on and keep these coming. Oh, I love the I love the standard meeting. Okay, so uh, so one other thing that we want to talk about. We're, we've been so far we've been talking about bits and pieces in little techniques, but uh, but where uh, the subtraction mindset really has an impact is when it becomes a movement in an organization or in a system. And we've got a couple examples. One, which is probably my favorite one is that people always say, oh, you can't change government. It's so difficult to do government. Um, gee, by the way, right now, right this minute, Huggy and I are doing a case study of how the Department of Motor Vehicles in, in uh, the state of California is reducing friction, and they're actually making progress. And, and I've been saying to our friends at Google, we're going to having a drink with a friend from Google, if the DMV can do it, you can do it. So, uh, so anyway, so Sevilla is this really interesting small nonprofit um, at Michigan started by a guy named Michael Brennan, who actually visited the Stanford D School for 10 weeks. And this helped him get going on this. And and he, he the first time I met him was at the Stanford D School. For those who've been there, he pulled out that form, uh, that that uh, that, uh, thou, that 42 page form and rolled it out on the floor of the D School and said, this thing sucks. It's making hard uh, people in Michigan to get benefits. It's driving them crazy. But what he did is rather than just complaining about it, he worked with residents, civil servants, the people who ran the, the agency that were responsible for the form, did a whole bunch of prototyping and actually fixed the form. So now the same form, which is completed by 2.5 million Michiganders, it's 80% shorter and you can see all the other benefits that came to this, including many fewer visits to field offices because people aren't confused. And I love this example because it, it, there's two lessons. One is it actually is possible to fix a friction even in a large bureaucracy. And two, it's a high friction um, uh, uh, you know, path of most resistance way to do it. He and his team slowly worked with everyone um, and, and they went through something like 1,700 pages of rules and requirements, for example. So this is my favorite example. Another one, why don't you talk about this one, Huggy, because you did this case study. Oh, <laughs> this was a case study that we wrote about AstraZeneca, which is, as you all know, a pharmaceutical company, operates in a very regulated environment. We would think that people don't have much discretion. But what was striking was uh, this young woman you see there, Pushkala Subramanian, she launched really like a subtraction movement and a simplification movement in the company. And one of the things they did was the result of the outcome was they actually saved AstraZeneca 2 million hours. Now, what's striking is they're measuring everything in terms of the number of days saved rather than the number of FTEs saved. Coincidentally, 2 million hours is roughly 1148 FTEs. But the point is not to save wage expenses. The point is to actually save time and to give employees, most importantly, the gift of time back. Why were they interested in saving 2 million hours? The reason is to help the company say, serve 4 million more customers, run 400 early phase trials and the like. And the point of this is, I think one of the questions that was posed by somebody was, how do we measure ROI or how do we measure an outcome? Folk, we would urge that you think of the number of 
hours saved or the number of the amount of days saved and what you're giving back to the organization. That's a good place to start. And as all of you know, when you give employees a gift, usually they reciprocate. And the evidence shows that if I give any of you a gift for a dollar, you're likely to reciprocate with a return gift anywhere between three to seven dollars. The basic problem with a lot of transformation in companies is it's all addition bias. There is no gift of time. And when addition bias is multiplied by time poverty, that's when efforts to transform enterprises stall. So, which is why we love this example. We also like Pushkala because after she was successful, they wanted to make her team into a permanent department. And she insisted, no, if you make me responsible only for friction fixing and all of you guys don't do your part, that would be self-defeating. So they didn't create a special purpose department. Yeah, she, in fact, she subtracted her team. She shut her team down. Yeah. So so, so one comment that the things are rolling by, and I'm not keeping up exactly, but but I, I but I think it's worth underlining that that in some of our examples that we've talked about is in the the one with Laszlo Bach is a great example at Google is that a lot of times you can use good friction to to reduce the amount of bad friction mm -hmm. and and just and just cutting here cutting the default minute meetings from thirty to fifteen minutes. If you want to make it longer, you have to go through some effort. So that's adding some friction. Um, Okay, so that's that's the stuff about uh, addition sickness. Now, this is the funnest chapter in my biased opinion. One of the things that we believe causes destructive friction is jargon monoxide. This is a term that uh, I guess we stole from Polly LeBaire, who used to be a fast company reporter. She visited my class, my class years ago and used this term. But this is bad and occasionally good friction caused by hollow and impenetrable babble. We've got a whole bunch of examples of different flavors. Let's start with bullshit. Um, since uh, Harry Frankfurt, who died just recently in 2005, wrote on bullshit, there's been a huge academic literature on the topic of bullshit. If, if you put bullshit into Google Scholar, it's amazing how much academic literature there is. So uh, so this is Andre Spicer, who's the dean of a business school in, in the UK. He defines it in his book on bullshit as empty and misleading communication crafted to serve the bullshitter's purposes. Um, I don't mean to um, you know, say bad things about Deepak Chopra, but there's actually been um, some academic articles where they have used his language as examples of bullshit. So, it, it, I, and maybe this means something to you, but imagination is inside exponential space-time events. Now, if you can translate that for me, you are smarter than I am. Um, and uh, here's another example, humaning. I, uh, we are no longer marketing consumers, but creating connections with humans. Okay. So anyway, so essentially this is meaningless talk to the bullshitter and bullshitty. Um, so it turns out the solutions for getting rid of, of bullshit of all forms and other forms of jargon are pretty simple. One is to force yourself to flush the old language, embrace the editor in chief role. And one of my favorite examples, this was at a, at, um, a sort of medium sized company that I worked with. What happened was, and I don't mean to bash consultants. I, many of us have been consultants. I am a consultant sometimes, so is Huggy. But but what happened was this woman got a boss uh, who was a new, new COO, and uh, he was from a consulting firm, and he kept using all these terms like pressure, test, and synergy, and she didn't know what they meant. So she kept forcing him to slow down and to do a definition. Um, it's, it's, yeah, so Luke, we'll get to LLMs in a minute. Um, and, um, and, 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 and a lot of times he figured out he didn't know what he was talking about and they got rid of the language. Um, so in group lingo, so Luke, we're going to get to this almost immediately. Uh, so specialized technical jargon. There's actually a bunch of research on the virtues of jargon. Jargon isn't all bad. It leads to precise, efficient communication among people who are part of the same field. It's not like jargon is all bad. But especially when people are communicating across boundaries, there's a huge problem. So, uh, so related to this, 
So Luke, we're going straight to your example that yes, LLMs can be really good for this. And I already previewed this. So Lifespan is the largest healthcare uh, provider in the state of Rhode Island. And, and this is just recently, this is was done in 2023 and the article was published in 2024 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And you can see the, the prompt. So it's the 14 word prompt while, while preserving the content and meeting convert this consent, it should say, should say consent form, to the average American reading level. Now, many of you may know, um, you all have Stanford degrees. Um, you're not the typical American. The typical American reads at the sixth grade level. Uh, so what they did was uh, the original form was to the 12th grade level. It was revised to the seventh grade level. This is now being completed by uh, by 35,000 people in the state of Rhode Island each year, a surgical consent form. And to give you an example of what ChatGPT did, you can see the original surgical consent form. Uh, I'm not going to read all the words, but uh, this is just a, a couple of sentences. The reading level was the 12th grade, 45 words. And you can see how many syllables per word. And then it was cut to the fourth grade level. And to me, this is this is uh, this is a good example. Is the legal meaning still the same? I think so. They it's got. If, if anybody who's in healthcare knows that there's lawyers everywhere, um, okay. And then one other thing about jargon that um, can they do this to all the California propositions? Yes, those things are incomprehensible. Um, so another kind of jargon that that we got interested in. It, and this was inspired by um, a bestseller by uh, Danny Kahneman, the famous Nobel Prize winner who just died a few weeks ago. In his last book with, uh, with a couple of co-authors, including the re incredibly productive Cass Sunstein, who seems to write a book every 10 minutes, is that, that he made this argument that in many cases, or they made this argument, in many cases that, um, that, that things in life are a random scatter of ideas, and it isn't just bias, it's just there's so much randomness that it's really hard to make decisions of any kind or to understand things. And our argument is that there are many cases where uh, phrases that used to mean something devolve over time um, into a random scatter of ideas. And I would nominate, and I hate to say it because I was sort of part of that movement and so was Huggy. I think this is what happened to design thinking. But uh, the best example, lawyers paid by the hour. Not I'm married to a good lawyer. A good lawyer can actually write, by the way. So, I, so I'm going to defend lawyers. Um, so anyhow, so my favorite example of this, so there's this Australian Agile coach, Craig Smith, and you can find this online. So he's really proud of himself that he gave this talk about where he defined 40 agile methods in 40 minutes. And, and to me, if you look at these 40 agile methods, maybe you can see more of a pattern than I can. This to me looks like a random scatter of ideas. So, so this is our perspective about jargon. Huggy, do you want to add anything else about jargon before, uh, before we move on to the next chapter? Which is, which is what, what do you think? The, the, the thing that we, really think uh, we, we really are concerned about jargon is jargon creates confusion. And not only does it create confusion, people swiftly disengage. <laughs> I have no I idea what people are talking about. So why should I really care about? And Deepak, you make an interesting point about attorneys. Uh, we actually have a bunch of Stanford students involved with a startup called Harvey. And what, that is exactly what they're doing. Um, they're actually using LLMs to do the work of associates and the like. But time and again, what Bob and I would love to emphasize is when you communicate in companies, communicating things in a way that even a 10-year-old kid can understand will actually help the message scale. Otherwise, it's never going to scale. So that's an example. And just, just to add it, just to be snide, so, so my wife, who actually was a contract attorney and also managing partner of a big law firm for years, uh, so, so there's something called holacracy some of you may have seen. Um, Zappos was most famous for having this, this sort of supposedly less bureaucratic structure, which is actually more bureaucratic. And we go after the holacracy constitution in the, in the book, and uh, it's this 8,000-word sort of incomprehensible document. And I asked sort of the founder of the Holacracy movement why it was so badly written. He blamed a lawyer. And my wife said, well, that's just a lawyer who can't write. So some lawyers can actually write if they want to. 
Okay, so maybe what we could do, Huggy, is j let's just go through uh, trap three, which is basically, uh, you know, the, the problem of bad friction. Uh, I mean, of good friction. Right. Um, and uh, and then let's let's get to uh, sort of comments and questions. Let's leave at least uh, 10 minutes for it. So is that fair? We do this in about five minutes. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. So, so, so in the book, we have a whole chapter on friction forensics. We also have a whole chapter on fast and frenzy is a trap. But, but let's just talk about this a little bit because I want to get to the conversation. Uh, so first of all, organizational friction is good when things are unlawful, when they're dangerous. So that's when you, when you want to make things impossible to do. And just to give you an example, since uh, Elizabeth Holmes is in, is in jail for uh, maybe not applying enough friction to slow down and actually lying, uh, there's, uh, there's two Stanford students I'm very, uh, I'm very uh, proud of, Greta Meyer and, um, and Amanda Calabrese. They started a company called Sequel, which has reinvented the modern tampon, which they argue has not uh, changed in 80 years. They both graduated from Stanford and they have FDA approval. So to me, that is possible to sort of go through the friction and do something that's good. Um, okay, so, so sometimes when, um, when friction is good, and we're gonna do this in about three minutes, when problems are really complex, you ought to slow down and figure them out. And there's this brand new study actually published since we wrote the book that showed essentially that people with higher IQs solve easy problems quicker but it, it takes them longer than people with uh, lower IQs to solve complex problems because they take the time to figure out how all the pieces fit together. So I really like that example. Uh, and, and they did this at Project Reform that improved that form. I already talked about that. If you're doing creative work, there's a whole bunch of evidence, uh, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but it's fundamentally an uh, inefficient process. And if you try to rush creativity too much, uh, you're going to screw it up. So Teresa Mable from Harvard Business School has studied creativity for 50 years, argues that when you try to hurry it up too much, that's one of the best ways to screw it up. And one of our heroes who we've written cases about and so forth, Ed Catmull from Pixar, always talked about this, that whenever we tried to rush things, we would screw it up. And uh, a, a third time when you want to slow down in the in the sort of language of the Supremes, you can't hurry love. There's all sorts of evidence that, uh, that yes, you can have swift trust in teams, people who, surgeons, airplane pilots, um, who just first meet each other and they can do their job quite well. But there's also evidence that teams where people take the time to form strong emotional bonds and understand who can do what, those are the most effective for doing difficult tasks. And, and I offer you, uh, you know, Warren Buffett and the late Charlie Munger as an example. So, and, and, and related to this, uh, there's a whole bunch of evidence, including from my colleague, uh, Kathy Eisenhart, um, that, uh, that people who start companies who have worked together before, have prior joint experience, they tend to be more effective. Um, so we're going to go to Q&A pretty quickly. So one more time, the best leaders are trustees of others' times. Uh, so friction fixers with the will and skill to make the right things easy and the wrong things harder. A parting word. This is from Clara Shai, who in a world where there are smart Stanford students, she might be one of the smartest ones I ever met. She was number one in computer science. She wrote a bestseller when she was 27 that, um, that argued that the social media would be important for business. Um, she started a company called Hearsay Social, and now she's uh, head of uh, CEO of AI. So Clara and I actually, we wrote together the last three paragraphs of the book. We wrote it over text. And, and, and what we wrote about was the notion that she argues that one of the things that helps her um, get her teams to fix friction is to, is to get them mentally prepared for the notion that it's a messy, confusing, frustrating process. And I like to end with that example because things aren't always easy and beautiful. If you're doing something hard, it's almost always messy, confusing, and frustrating at times. Okay, so we've got 10 minutes for questions. Hi there, Jen Mellum. Question like, my company does a lot of great work for people, you know, performance management, like culture, values, et cetera. And I, as a leader, like it is so much addition that I'm like, of course, people management and employee engagement is so important that I feel like the bad guy, if it's like 
there is so much going on. So I wonder if there are any tips or success stories you've seen in sort of eliminating some of the the overhead of that while still driving employee experience. You know, <clears throat> thank you for that question. Uh, you know, Bob and I wrote a case study about Adobe where the chief people officer at Adobe, one of the things they, she realized was how much time was being devoted to the performance appraisal process. And eventually what she did was they decided to drop it entirely. And they decided to give people guidelines. Uh, you know, it, it's a work in process, but the way certainly you know, I'd suggest that you think about performance management is there's all the rear view mirror. What did you do two months ago, et cetera, et cetera, and then giving a raise or whatever it is. But the more vital kind of performance management for us is feed forward. Are you able to convey to your colleagues uh, and team members in a short time? What do you want them to do more of in the next fortnight? What do you want them to do less of during the next fortnight? And what is it that they're doing that's confusing the heck out of you? And that may open up the conversation for them to tell you, what do they want you to do more of during the next uh, two weeks, less of in the next two weeks? And there are some things you may be doing that's confusing them as well. So what you want is, Feed forward focuses on getting the employee to look through the windscreen rather than the rear view mirror. Bob, do you want to add, amend, challenge? Well, well I mean, just just an example, just to have some discipline to look where, I'm thinking of, of CHROs. I've been talking a lot of them lately to sort of look through things that there's just too many. So just an example, and this is actually a general counsel. I uh, Once I did the subtraction game like we just did, but it was a longer version of it, with a pharmaceutical company and the, the general counsel raises his hand. This is a, a global company. And he said, we have 87, I just counted them. He said, 87 family leave policies in our company, 87. Uh, and, and it was different laws in different countries. So we know where this came from. So what he did was he wrote me back two weeks later, I got it down to 60. I think that's pretty good as a percentage of subtraction, 60 is still a lot. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is somebody, Fei, how do you pronounce your name? Fei Lu? I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name. I bet I am. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's Fei. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so just one practice, since I'm stealing this straight from Clara Shai. So, so I said, Clara, how do you do this when you're launching a new project? Um, and so she's a good computer scientist. As you said, in computer science, we have something called separation of concerns. So what I do is I have one team who is sort of, their job is to execute as if things are going well. And then I pull aside another team who are basically the cleanup on aisle nine crew. And they are ready to do with, deal with things that are all screwed up. So essentially, we're planning for things to go wrong. I thought that was a pretty good example. And a good example of her using her computer science degree, too. Yeah. So that. Yeah, if, if I can just uh, extend, Sharon Richmond, of course, who's a GSB alum and a friend of ours as well. So Sharon, I noticed that you're suggesting stop, start, and continue. So here was the quick thought that crossed my mind. I have an ambivalent reaction to the start, stop, and continue format. And I understand the wisdom of it, of course. It's been used before. But the the where I find myself uh, well, concerned is the moment you give people options saying stop, start, and continue, they're actually going to in increase the continue bucket and the start bucket. You want to make it very sharp and say, what do you want people to stop? And that way you focus them on thinking. Otherwise, they park things that they like in the other two columns. That's what I found. And I don't know whether your experience is different, but I just thought I'd kind of give that a quick shout out. It, it's a great point. I think the other thing I put in there was the four Ds. I don't know if anyone else has come across the four Ds. Where's with, that? Uh, oh, it's I put it up a bit earlier, Huggy, but it's the idea is that we tell people, you know, let's teach everybody how to delete what we no longer need, Mm. To delegate things that you don't need to do, but someone else can do to uh, defer, sorry, defer comes second, to defer things we can wait and do later, 
So we actually prioritize. And the last one, some people say deny and other people say do. So it's like whether you choose what we're not doing or what we are doing, but it's a way to really help with that practice because it's so atypical. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm drawn to this 4D framework. It has the virtue, as you know, of simplicity, uh, Sharon. The one thing I worry about is the column called delegate, <laughs> whether it's going <laughs> yes, to be true. populated by a lot of things. <laughs> if the easiest, the low-cost cognitive thing is, hey, I'm going to delegate. And that's yes. kind of what worries me there. But other than that, I certainly am drawn to that as well. Yeah, agree. So, so how you what, what's your take on this one which one Bob? wait wait things are happening so fast so what are good traits or skill sets to look for for appointing some track and champions at, at a large corporation what makes them successful uh well for starters i'd say give them power what else <laughs> i think uh the vijay that's a really good question uh the way i would kind of like uh um uh, think about the good traits or skill sets is um, the first thing is people need to be very curious because if you're not curious, you're not going to kind of like do any search and any understanding because just because you Vijay say something is bad friction, I should at least investigate whether it's good friction for somebody else, for example. So it's like a pretty simple thing. So curiosity is big. The other thing that I would recommend is, you know, generosity. You want people who are not interested in extracting efficiency gains only. They, you want people actually who want to help improve the experience of work. Because that's like we spend a lot of time doing that. It's not making things efficient. It's actually making them, making the experience of work better. And you know what, Vijay? You may not agree with me, but you also want to find people who are extremely skilled at parsing nonverbal cues in companies. And if you ask me, the people who are the best at parsing nonverbal cues in any company that I've been to are the receptionists. Invisible to most people, but highly attentive to subtle emotional variations of people. They don't know, they know whom to crack a joke with, they know whom to let alone today, you know, all of that. So you want a mix of people uh, and not just people at one hierarchical level. And the thing I would advise against is don't put people at the top echelons on an exercise like this, because they often may not know how work gets done three levels beneath them. Yep. And in fact, one study shows they underestimate coordination costs within enterprises by as much as 50%. So I hope that helped, Vijay. All right. So I guess we're at time. Thank you yeah. to all of you for joining us and for all your questions and comments. Yeah, I want to second that. We're very grateful to all of you for having taken the time to join us today. And one other thing we want to say again and again is, and this is something I've learned from Bob, the most important thing about writing a book is not writing a book and selling it. It's actually creating a community of people who are interested in improving the experience of work. So yes. don't just think that this is the last conversation we're going to have. If you have any ideas, any suggestions, any questions, don't hesitate to please get in touch with yes. us. Yes. You might do something cool in a company we might not know of. Uh, and so please, please uh, uh, reach out to us. But most of all, please kind of make sure that you do something to address the problem of time poverty of employees. People are truly time poor. And for Bob and I, there was a young woman who said this with a quiver in her voice and a tear in her eye. And she said, you know, when I finish all the work I do, which mostly is BS work in my company, I'm exhausted. And she said, when I go home, I only have the scraps of myself for my family. That was like a punch to my solar plexus and Bob's as well. That's wrong. We cannot design work 
where employees feel they only have the scraps of themselves when they go home. And we can't psychologize it by calling it burnout. And here's a meditation app and you go and like meditate or whatever. The real problem is the design of organizations. Yes. The design of work. And that's where we really appreciate your help and joining us in this effort to make work better as an experience, right. not a grind. Thank you all. Thank lovely comments, Huggy. Change, change organizations. Change organizations. Change the world.